Hi, I'm Beverly McKenzie. He's giving you my bio. I'm presently doing my PhD in IoT and blockchain security. Here's Scott. Hi, I'm uh, Scott McKenzie. Um, I've been working in the industry for a fair bit over 20 odd years across lots of areas, lots of areas of um, Unix uh, security, infrastructure, architecture, pretty much just a general uh, technophile really. So um, yeah, today we're going to talk to you about denial of, about denial of service, about um, distributed denial of service, how it's evolved, the techniques, um, the various mitigations. We'll look at uh, some of the um, case studies, um, probably just uh, look at Slalorus, which is, shows a number of very, very interesting mitigations that can be applied. Um, and then we'll move on to a uh, question and answer towards the end. So um, to start off with, looking at the um, protocol distinction, most denial of service attacks can be grouped into um, two. You've got your network-based layer three and four um, style attacks, and then you've got the slightly more difficult to deal with um, layer seven application level attacks. So. Um, just to run through the concepts, because these are fundamentals to what a lot of the uh, other attacks are based on. Uh, reflection, essentially, the attacker would um, would um, choose the IP address of the victim. They would spoof that IP address and they would fire a request with that spoofed IP address at um, a number of different resolver services, which would be able to then reflect the data back to the victim. Amplification, as the name sounds, the concept behind it is you send a small number of packets into one of many services and they respond with a much larger response. And obviously these concepts can be scaled up. Um, I found this very nice table that shows some of the amplification factors of the different UDP protocols here. So um, as you can see, uh, commonly used are the DNS and NTP um, attacks, things like uh, firing a monolist to NTP, which chucks back a fair bit of data. Uh, interestingly, Memcache gives an almost 50,000 increase in um, response, so it's uh, quite desirable. Um, your flood attacks essentially are basically just chucking large amounts of data at a target, um, normally launched from uh, botnets. So. So. What is a DOS attack? Well, a DOS came before DDoS, and that's where it all started. Thank you. <laughs> so a DOS attack is quite brilliant. Um, what it does is it spoofs usually, but there are some new techniques which doesn't require spoofing, but it usually spoofs an IP address, and it gets an amplification attack or a reflection attack where you get loads of reactions um, from hosts, um, either to a broadcast or other mechanisms back at the spoof address. Oh, right. <laughs> so let's go back to the beginning, the Smurf attack and the Fraggle attack. That started in 1997 from a guy called T-Freak, which I assume is not the name his mum gave him. And he was the first person to launch a DOS attack. And the first one was labelled a Smurf attack. And it was quite cool because what they did, as you probably all know, is they used Echo... They use ICMP echo packets. They threw those at the broadcast and they used a spoof IP. And it was the response from the others getting back to the broadcast message that triggered the first DOS attack. A variant on that was the UDP packets used in Fraggles. Right. <laughs> I'm on the ball here. Right, so the mitigations, um, they're quite straightforward. Um, close down UDP port 7. Um, in your Unix and Linux environment, don't leave daemons that you don't need running. Close down all your daemons in your Windows environment, close your services. Um, you've also got, don't um, allow broadcasting unless you need it. Echo, um, replay and echoes. Um, close those down if you can, but they are network diagnostics, so um, keep a few open. You've got... You've also got um, a request for comment. Um, 
a request for comment, which is actually stipulated that the, one of the easiest way to stop DOS attacks is to for ISPs to stop allowing illeg illegitimate packets leaving their network. So if you've got an IP that doesn't actually exist in your network, don't allow it onto the wider world network. Another thing is if we all as hosts in the network don't allow illegal or illegitimate packets to float around, i.e. if they've got private network IP, we drop it. We don't pass it on. Simple things like that can stop DOS attacks. And if you think DOS attacks are over, think again. You have companies such as Powertech and NetScan who are actually providing a service to um, script kiddies and crackers. And the service they provide is they scan networks that are not implementing the correct security and then they put that information up. So it's alive and it's well and it's still growing. So uh, jumping on to Solaris as a case study. Now, interestingly, this is one of my favorite DDoS uh, methods, if you can have a favorite, really. It's... Um, it's named after a rather cute little primate that moves really, really slowly. And uh, the advantage of all this, with very little input, an attacker can create quite an impressive amount of uh, damage. So um, it primarily affects thread-based web servers, and um, the most common of those is Apache. So it's based around the concept of a standard HTTP GET request, which uh, we all use on a day, daily basis. Now, within the HTTP 1.1 protocol, your uh, GET request will be, um, for your header, will be terminated with a carriage return line feed, uh, and then another carriage return line feed. Uh, what Solaris does is sit there, sends the first carriage return line feed, and then only a carriage return and leaves the web server waiting for that final uh, line feed. Now, um, Apache will sit and listen for a default of 300 seconds for the HTTP header request to, to complete. And um, then it will reset that counter again uh, as soon as the client sends any additional data. So um, basically, if the malicious user sends multiple requests, it will quickly flood the system. It also evades most of your firewall IDS and IPS systems because it's not a malformed request which makes it an interesting one to mitigate. So looking at um, Apache, first of all, as forms of mitigation, there's um, three uh, common Apache modules that um, I would recommend you can mitigate with. So firstly, uh, mod rec timeout. That's really quite useful because that allows you to um, set a, a uh, bytes per second rate for delivering the HTTP headers and the time to do for the whole um, header delivery to complete. And any failure uh, to complete within that time span will result in the server issuing a 408 request timeout back to the client. It's also got similar configuration options for the uh, body message. So it's quite useful um, across the board, not just for slow lawyers, but it's a mitigation for lots of other uh, DDoS and, and um, slow attack methods. Second one would be to use mod QoS. Uh, this allows prioritization of your HTTP requests and um, allows you to set limits on a number of connections from a single source IP, which can be quite useful. Um, it will also monitor how your server's performing and under, above certain thresholds it will disable your HTTP keeper lives. Um, it also allows you to then set a um, throughput rate as well. And the final recommendation for Apache modules would be mod security. Now, this is a complete web application firewall, so this mitigates um, not just um, the DDoS, but also things like cross-site scripting, cross-site reflection, same origin, and various other things. But just keeping the focus here on Solaris mitigation, what it does also is to monitor how many uh, 408 errors have been returned to a client. And if there's a certain number within a particular period that you configure, um, any future requests coming from that client will just be stopped in their tracks by sending a TCP fin packet. So additional mitigations for Solaris, which again work for lots of other um, DOS and DDoS type attacks, depending on your budget, uh, stick an HTTP load balancer in front of it. Um, for example, an F5 big IP. I don't work for F5. I've just successfully used them a lot in the past. 
Um, and basically that would sit there and listen for a complete HTTP request before that's forwarded on to the web server. You could also look to use a uh, non-threaded web server like Nginx. I know there was a case where uh, someone coded Galoris as a similar slow attack for Nginx, but that's since been patched. So don't use the old versions of Nginx. And also if you're running on Linux, then IP tables allows you to uh, set connections per second. Uh, you can also exclude proxies as well because obviously if lots of people are coming from one proxy address, that could uh, be blocked, and that's not something you wouldn't want either. So a few other tools, and if we've got time, then we can go back to some of them. But uh, there's a few tools out there, and we can run through some, some of the methods of how you can mitigate those. So looking at one of the largest DDoS attacks that we had um, in recent history, there was a case of Spam House versus Cyberbunker. Now, Cyberbunker got its name because they operate out of an old Cold War nuclear site. Um, they're a Dutch hosting company, and their policy is generally anything goes as long as it's not child porn or terrorism. Now, Spam House uh, basically identified that they were hosting a large number of internet spammers, and so they uh, blacklisted them. The result was the biggest at that time uh, DDoS attack occurred against Spam House, which peaked at uh, just over 300 gigabits per second. Now, they were able to mitigate this because they utilized um, Cloudflare's CDN and their um, Anycast routing system. So the IP address was presented for Spam House by Cloudflare, and then that was distributed across their 23 data centers worldwide. And so, quite impressively, they were able to absorb the full impact of that 300 gigabits DDoS. So, the, uh, following on from that, because that used a techno technique called um, DNS amplification, um, bind, the later versions of Binder patch to introduce a feature called um, RRL, the response rate limit, that allows you to uh, basically tweak your DNS servers to um, avoid uh, the the use of them for uh, one of these amplification attacks. So, um, yeah, this always crosses our minds. So, basically, CDNs are a really useful tool to have in the toolbox. Uh, depending on the company, some want, may want to set it up themselves, running multiple systems worldwide, or either use one of the free ones or purchase the commercial service of them. But, yeah, this basically can act to mitigate a large number of DDoS attacks. So this is flashing is another thing that we don't see very often, but is potentially very, very dangerous because anywhere where you can do a network firmware update on a device, um, if that's a malformed firm firmware, you can essentially brick the device. Now, the context is very important here because if this is a smart meter across an electric grid, then um, the consequences could be extremely major. Uh, black holing is another uh, mitigation technique that we will come across to, to mitigate, basically tweaking the BGP routes, and you can channel your traffic, your DDoS traffic, down to basically a devnull type location, or off to a particular location so the traffic can be examined and forensically interrogated. So, pass you back to Bevan. So we come to IoT DOS, DDoS attacks, which are quite new. Um, the first one occurred in 2016. But before we go over that, there are two types of IoT DDoS attacks. You first have attacks on IoT devices, which we haven't seen very much yet. There's been um, a couple of cases, and we'll go over those. And then you have IoT devices being used to attack other um, host nodes within a network. Now, IoT devices, if you don't know what they are, are small form um, computers that are embedded in many things, too many things. You've got them in your fridge, your router, your insulin pump. You've got them in your kids' toys. And it's been estimated that in the next two years, there will be 21 billion IoT devices in our homes and our lives. And one of the problems, well, there are several problems with them. Um, but some of the major problems is that they exist within a heterogeneous network. There's really poor interoperability between um, different companies. 
they fundamentally suffer from integrity, confidentiality, and authorization issues. And we saw the earlier um, IoT um, cases were kids' toys being used to harvest information, including um, kids' photographs, voices, address, and likes and dislikes via IoT devices, and we can see where that goes. Um, we also saw um, uh, one, well, two um, three-letter organizations um, harvesting information via a weeping angel um, an attack using IoT devices. So the early runners were the early runners were quite um, small but quite scary. But then we started to see changes, and in 2016 we saw the first change. The Mirai bug um, DOS attack, the DDoS attack, came along. Then we had the Pasaya, which hasn't actually happened. It's harvesting, and it's been noted, and it's scary. And then we've got the um, the moose, which is kind of funny, uh, sad, and a tad bit scary. And I'll go into those. So let's start with Mirai. Um, this happened June 2016, and this was the first time people became aware, everybody outside of IoT became aware of its potential. And what it did was it took, um, they recruited any IoT devices in the network, and what the bot master did was then got those devices to send um, lookup queries to a uh, German ISP. And it flooded, it flooded the network to the point where you had a network storm and traffic couldn't come in or go out. And it was kind of a good goal for them insofar as that they stopped, um, they affected companies like Netflix as well as taking down the actual ISP. So it was um, a proof of concept in many ways. And it proved what could be done. Then they released the code out there on GitHub, so anyone can get a copy. I've got a copy. And that seemed to be as bad as it got until pronounces as you like, it's Arabic. And um, in 2017, a company called Trend noticed unusual activities taking place in um, cameras, IoT cameras. And they documented it, logged it, and watched it. And what was happening is I, um, these cameras have a plug-and-play um, mechanism which allows easy access for us all who just want to get on and do what we want to do. But the downside is it's um, not secure. And this was um, actually brought to the industry's attention and they supposedly patched it, but it still exists in many devices. And this was is being exploited at this moment by this new... DDoS. And these devices are basically where um, we're believing are going to be used because of the way they send their SSD packets out. They don't actually need to spoof an IP. So these devices will be up to 120,000 cameras on the network are predicted to be infected and we're still waiting to see what their target is and what they're intending to take down. So this is one to come sometime, and we believe it's originating from the Middle East um, due to some of the data and stuff used within, but that could not be true, or it could be true. And then we've got the Linux Moose. Not quite a DDoS, but it's using um, command and control. It's using all the, um, the fingerprints of... Um, a DDoS attack, and it's actually monetized it for the ego market. Um, I like it because it's funny, and I don't use the ego market, and I'm amazed at what these people will do. But it's actually going out there and taking over routers, and then hijacking packets uh, which relate to social networks, and then allowing people to dupe those networks into allowing them to have more views or whatever you do on those networks. So that's the indication of where monetization of this um, technology is actually going to go. You've got two players or two actors. You've got the monetization and you've got government actors that seem to be dominating this market. 
So mitigation is the same old, same old patch. Um, in 2015, um, you had um, Fiat um, had to do a mass recall. 1.4 million of their cars had to be recalled because um, drive-by um, DOS, which is a uh, DDoS attacks, were taking place the first type, where car security was so flaky that people could take over the steering wheel, engine management, the engine of the car while it was on the road. And they had to do a quick recall to patch their systems up. So patching is your first line of defense. You then got a small growth, but a growth nonetheless, of anti-malware taking place in IoT. It's been um, network-based, M2M networks, because of the um, interoperability and the heterogeneous nature of IoT devices. It's difficult, if not impossible, at this stage to design anti-malware to go on the devices. Plus, you've got hardware and memory size problems. Change the password. I mean, where that's possible, it's very difficult to change a password on your networked fridge because they generally don't give you the ability. But where you can, change the password. Close ports down. Um, if you've got a plug and play device, don't allow um, devices on your side of the network to um, use the plug and play. Disactivate it. Don't allow it to happen. Um, in the case of Mirai, you can actually flush that by just turning your device off and on again because it's held in memory. Within, with respect to Perseiri, that's not possible. It actually will, uh, you can turn it off and turn it on. You will still be contaminated more to the point. You can actually change your password and because of a zero date exploit, which is known of, it will come back. It's literally, I mean, we're looking at ways of trying to stop this, but the devices that are affected are affected. Um, you can, standardization, I'm a strong believer in standardization. You've got six low PAM, which is IP version six um, um, application for small form IoT devices combined with 802.14.5. And there are security measures that are contained within those that could also help but the bottom line is a lot of companies are going for this, security via obscurity. And as Kirchhoff has said, this is no security at all. So I'm a strong believer that the industry has to come together. We have to come up with standards. We have to implement security. I remember um, Microsoft when they first came on a long time ago and the security was flaky then. They're now really secure. They've come in line. And if we as an industry can actually get standards in place, we can up our game. So just um, looking at some of the things that have happened this year, we've had um, teams from um, Europol, a combination of the Dutch police and the um, UK's NCA. Um, they shut down uh, Web Stressor, which was one of the largest stressor sites um, responsible for basically selling DDoS as a service. And uh, Web Stressor allowed you to rent out a service and... Um, for various fees. Its admin was spread out in various locations um, around the world and in different places they've been taken to custody. But um, they, could be, they were basically charging fees that were as low as 15 euros a month for their DTOS capability. So basically looking at booters and stressors, in this um, stressing service has sprung up over the last few years. Uh, the the services are being sold to subscribers and um, some of them are happy to call themselves booters. Some of them f think it's better to call themselves um, stressors because they're testing the limits of your network. Uh, you're on flaky legal ground either way. So very quickly, just having a look at the motivations. Um, there's um, probably five different ones. Finance always comes into play. You've got the revenge case, which is normally amongst um, kids and um, arguing over online games in a lot of cases or pranking them. In some cases, there's um, ideological belief or hacktivism that uh, is the motivation uh, that sprung up a lot with Anonymous and uh, the low and then the high orbit iron cannons. Uh, for some people, it's the intellectual challenge. And there's certain nation states that are looking at it as a potential for cyber warfare. 
So there's an example of some of the adverts that we've seen out there for um, DDoS as a service. So uh, yeah, some of our takeaways here. Patch everything up, disable your UPnP, um, look to put let web balances in and maybe CDNs, things like that. Disable DNS and NTP access queries to everyone out there on the internet, uh, otherwise you're complicit. There are RSC guidelines out there as how you can do a number of the mitigations. Um, interesting one and somewhat controversial f because people do use Tor for legitimate reasons because depending on where they are in the world. If your reason, if your users of your site and your application have no good reason to be connecting from Tor, for example, they're doing internet banking, why you would want to do that going through Tor in the first place, I'm not sure given the bank already has all your details, then just block all the Tor endpoints. You can download lists to find out where they are because an awful lot of the attacks will come through the Tor endpoints. So just leaving it here. Open up to some questions. I don't agree with the Tor statement. <laughs> <laughs> I think there are um, lots of reasons to use Tor and, I mean, blocking people that, who aren't part of this world, our Western world, and stopping them having access by blocking Tor. There are other ways of actually stopping DOS attacks, DDoS attacks, which don't involve actually excluding people who aren't in our world. But anyway, we're opening it up to questions. <laughs> so if anyone's got any questions, go ahead. Cool. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, it, just to say that uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I think you gave, gave a lot of um, information. The only thing maybe that was missing is... Uh, Talking from uh, an experience I had in a previous company, uh, if, um, for example, your net, your company has uh, one gig or ten uh, gigabit uh, network interface to the internet, and you receive, uh, for example, a seventy gigabit uh, DDoS on your company, which is a common now. So I think the biggest record is one dot four terabyte for GitHub on March. Um, the thing that uh, we were missing back then, I was, I needed to know is to know the phone number of the ISP. Because sometimes if uh, the ISP uh, can, can sustain the attack, you can always contact him. Uh, say you can block this port. Because luckily for us, DDoS are scary, but they are usually focused on few, as you mentioned, UDP ports. So if you can report to the ISP, please block this port for our company. That's a good thing to know. But if you don't know the phone number, or the guy who knows the number is not uh, available, <laughs> Yeah, I think um, I, I've, I'm actually IS27, IS2007 compliant. So yes, in your disaster recovery um, plan, um, you should actually have the various numbers and ISP would be one of those um, to basically shut down the attack. And that complies with RFC. I can't remember the number, but that also requests that ISPs are actually the front line. So yeah, thanks for reminding me. Any more questions? You mentioned that Tor is now a popular uh, entry or start point for attacks. Uh, as far as I can recall, Tor was always perceivably slow and not very efficient in delivering tons of traffic to a, a single endpoint. Uh, just curious if that, if Tor is actually now powerful enough for that. Okay, I would view it more in the case of if you're looking at um, some of your slow type attacks, your layer sevens, your um, things like Solaris, uh, Rudy, that sort of thing, where you're sending packets very, very slowly in, but multiples of those. If you can do that for multiple Tor endpoints scattered all over the world, you're still opening up and using up all those requests. It doesn't require much input. Also, if you're using Tor at that point to come in as your starting point for then an amp amplification and reflection attack, that takes place after that. You're masking your origin uh, to quite a high degree and then um, still performing a significant attack. So if you can cut, if you don't need to use it for your site and your services, you can block it. If you do, that's a different matter. But it's just one of many mitigations. You can't, I'm a strong believer in defense in depth and you can't rely on just one magic bullet that fixes everything. Thank, thanks for the talk. So I, I noticed one thing you didn't talk about was services like Akamai and Cloudflare 
or maybe I missed it. I was sleeping. For <laughs> but um, I. Uh, you, okay, you pat, um, I must so have missed it. it sorry, it was hidden away in there a little. Bit. <laughs> yeah. I, I, um, I mean, do, do you think that? It, I mean, those are very good for layer seven, like you said, right? It's layer seven protection. You're protecting your applications. If you log organization, you really this is probably what you need. Do you think we need to take that concept down another level and actually start looking at layer three protection at the same and the same methodology, or w do you think we'll never get there because? networks are inherently distributed and, and you don't want to go through a single point of failure? I think at a level you could take it down there. It depends again on the size of your organization. So you would still look to do things like uh, blocking and controlling a lot of this traffic at your edge routers, at your firewalls. Depending on the size of your organization, you might run your own internal BGP between uh, multiple sites, multiple data centers. So yes, at that point you could do, implement this. Um, a lot of these services um, block things like broadcasting and um, people who try to send spoofed IP addresses at source if you're in there. So, I actually had a follow-up question, but a different question, but if you had something to add. Um, yeah, as I said, you can. There is a request for comments actually asking people if, we, if you could implement some simple things like not forwarding illegitimate packets. Um, there are IDS and other things like that are coming along a long way. So blocking a network, but you have problems with, so you could block, um, say, your internet, but what about Wi-Fi? What about all the other networks? How do you jump over? And you've got six low pan. Uh, you've got a problem there where um, encryption problems with the symmetric or asymmetric encryption for IoT devices, asymmetric being too uh, much data, but symmetric, how do you do your handshake and stop Alice from, um, sorry, Eve from listening to it? So you've got problems. The idea would be your layer, network layer blocking, but there are problems which relate to the various different types of technology. But I think we should aim for the ideal. Uh, just because it's difficult doesn't mean we shouldn't try to get there. So my, my other question is, um, if you think about large organizations, I mean, a lot of times nowadays you're outsourcing, you're probably hosting your data centers and co-location site. Have you actually looked at the potential impact of having multiple customers in a co-location site where one customer is the target of an attack? Okay. okay. Um, in that case... Uh, once again, if you're running something like AnyCast routing um, to, or a CDN service at a point in your colos, you can uh, distribute that traffic around between your different sites. You can almost isolate it because you're, I assume you're using um, with different customers in that case, uh, different parts of the cloud model in there, so essentially you're different tenants and they're isolated off, so you can actually shift tendencies and migrate those to different locations to handle that routing. You need to maybe be a little bit creative, look at your logs that sort of thing and have um, network admin and security admin who are on the ball but um, yes, that can be done. I think it's covered most things. The only thing I would say is you should have redundancy and failover. So um, if you're having traffic coming to one site, try and fail over. That's what it's there for. Um, and that will help. There are other things that you can do higher up in your design, but that goes into a lot of information. Maybe we can talk about that afterwards. But um, I submitted a paper that's going to be talked about in South Africa, covering an awful lot of that from various different layers. So maybe later. So thank you for mentioning response rate limiting, uh, but I have two observations uh, and could use help from this audience in both. Uh, the first is it's not the default, uh, either for bind nor for uh, NSD nor for power DNS. The vendors are waiting for you, the users, to insist on it being the default. Um, and the second is... Uh, DNS is not the only service which must be open in some cases, and so it turns out a lot of other things need some kind of rate limiting. And uh, in the perfect world that is along that path, everything has rate limiting, which means we have 
maybe a billion times more state in the network than we have today. And that state uh, has cost in both CPU time and RAM and complexity and diagnostics. Uh, in other words, uh, that path leads to hell. And RRL is very much a band-aid until we can find some way to get BCP38, the source address, uh, the filtering, at the far end where there is no economic reason to do it. So we're pushing on a rope, and um, I, I, I would uh, love it if we could push harder. Uh, Europe in particular seems to be willing to uh, use prior restraint in regulation. You might consider what Finland has done, where it is illegal to not have source address filtering, and uh, possibly the rest of Europe could adopt that also. Thank you. Thank you. That's a, actually a very valid point that uh, the push for legislation can actually force change. So, yes, that's very useful. Um, anyone else? <laughs> okay, well, thank, thank you, besides. <laughs>